analysis of social function in human collectives. And just an overview of my project, the main question uh, I asked and that I would, you know, ask to uh, people here is what is the state of human existence in relation to organizing ourselves? What is to become of an individual when they enter into a social agreement with another? What is formed? Now, with this project, there are two main things that I wanted to achieve. Um, the first, it was a kind of establishing of an ability to discuss my project. My project is a kind of an amalgamation of many different areas of interest that I had, ranging from sociology to linguistics to uh, philosophical ideas. And because of that, uh, grouping together, it could get very messy very fast when discussing and trying to look at different social interactions between us humans. So the first thing I wanted to do was be able to establish a kind of lexicon, a kind of vocabulary, so that uh, uh, to kind of expedite the process to make this an easy endeavor. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to do um, was to, and this is the main body of my project or what my project was, was to create a system that is similar to different sociological forms of analysis to both determine to what degree this happens, this being the entering in of people into greater forms of collectives, I call them, which we will learn more about in the next slide. Um, and what is the baseline occurrence for social grouping um, and social ordination, which I will also go on to define. These terms are part of this kind of lexicon, and I will preface this presentation by saying, as we go along, these terms are to be, uh, I, I will kind of be giving those definitions. Um, so, you know. All right, so here I explain a little bit more about what I mean and by a common lexicon for this project um, and why I decided to use it. Um, with many different areas of not just um, academic fields, but just in our lives, we're always forming different kind of vocabularies to discuss things. I mean, if you just think of math, um, say geometry, different terms, different words when used in a um, context of, you know, that area of math will mean completely different things than if you were just in a coffee shop with somebody. And this is true for sociology. This is true for um, different areas of English. Um, and this is the kind of expediting of the process that I was thinking of. Um, this idea that we can take our language and focus it in um, into different areas so that when we're discussing uh, these concepts, we don't need to just keep uh, <laughs> inventing new words. We don't need to keep coming up with new things. We have the words already. We can use the duality of them to come up with different meanings. And thus we can discuss these complex things that we would need, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of words to do. And actually the same amount we can use uh, when we're at, you know, Walmart buying a uh, wiffle ball bat. And this is the reason I chose to include this kind of common lexicon, this vocabulary aspect to my project, as I thought it would really help to not only um, expedite this process, but also to kind of show off that when we're doing these projects, when we're talking of these fields of interest, we're not restricted by everyday language. We're not restricted by, you know, uh, words in their simple first definition. We can go to their second, their third. We can uh, look at their linguistic history and go back on them. So that is the main reason I chose to have this kind of uh, idea of establishing some new terms to discuss my project with. So just a bit of a reiteration before we get on to it. The main project was to uh, understand that, or to get an understanding of what it is that social, uh, higher social being and complexes in, with humans, to understand what happens when we as individuals forfeit that kind of individuality, at least to some extent, to form these complex human societies, these complex human, beings and modes of existing. Now, I use the term collective as a general net to mean all these different forms of social interaction and hierarchical structure um, within these uh, establishments. And a collective could be anything from a hunter-gatherer tribe 
to a nation, to a religious group, even corporations. These are all social beings. These are all social organisms that have the necessary components to be a collective. Um, when we're getting to the next slide, but most importantly, what they have is that hierarchy. Um, they have that greater uh, indication of social function that they always go for a main uh, uh, idea or goal to be accomplished. And that was um, the main project I wanted to do is to be able to have a kind of a system of analysis to look, to discuss that, um, and to give that ability to others who may be interested in that kind of discussion. So I keep, I, I've now said the word collective a few times. So it's time that we start that uh, lexicon and we ask like, what does that mean? You know, cause obviously in everyday conversation, a collective will mean something completely different than the context I'm using it in. So contextually we can now understand what I mean by this. So the collective is one of the most important aspects of this project as it has a, um, or it has the heart of social function and thus is the focal point of what we are here to look at. I see most collectives with only the exceptions of some that do not have hierarchies as outliers. So I previously mentioned that a collective is that uh, human organization, uh, that simple people grouping together and continuing on with something um, with, like I said, hierarchical structure. Now, I can note that this hierarchical structure is varying from different um, collectives that we, we can say, you know, a, a hierarchy in one business may not be the same as the other. A hierarchy in one nation is obviously not going to be the same as the other. I mean, we can ju just think of, you know, how the governmental system works in, say, France uh, versus Mexico. And we would immediately understand that those two things, though both having a hierarchy, are different from one another. Now, first, though we can most definitely preface this discussion with that idea of social function in relation to humans, I do want to establish this, and that is the predominant mode of existence socially in terms of collaboration with one another and not of individual survival, both currently and through most of our past has been of hierarchical structures. Uh, it's very important that we understand that I'm not speaking uh, in terms of an individual. This is uh, the complete opposite. I'm speaking in terms of what happens when we group together and we form higher modes of being. And as we've seen throughout our history, um, and I don't think it'd be very controversial to say that since the hunter-gatherer tribes of our past to our modern interconnected global system of politics and economic prosperity, that we're in a group always, we're in a community even. Uh, so we can remember that this project is a uh, rectification of the ability to examine all these different uh, social groups, all these different areas of interest. So the collective as I see it, and like I said, this is a general term um, for all these different ways that people can organize themselves socially is a great way to think of it. I see there being components of it. I see there being three components of it. Um, and these components have to gain an aim for the collective and an aim for what to be achieved. So when speaking about the collective and its components, I believe that there are three aspects that all social collectives have and use for a predication for their collaboration, their function, and their continuity. The first, uh, and I should say this, I did not mention it in this slide anywhere, but I should say these are numbered. There's no real importance to these numbers. It's more just for organizing. So there's no numeric value. It's not like one is more important than two. Anyway, but I digress. Um, so I see these three components being thusly. Number one, I think of something, uh, I think of the, the first component as being the physical. The physical is the aspect of the collective um, the general betterment of the people, or at least proclaimed to be, and the general population that will make up a social group, a social uh, a function. Obviously, you can't have, say, a hunter-gatherer tribe without hunter-gatherers. The physical is that. The physical is the what is in our realm. There's nothing abstract. There's nothing metaphysical about it. It is those who is everyday people. It's we as humans who make up these... Um, groups. It's the CEOs, the shareholders, the workers, it's the presidents, it's the 
you know, lawmakers, it's the law enforcement, it's the homeless men on the street, it's everything we can think of that would physically be bound to our social engagements and our social organizing of each other. The second I see um, as being the idea. The idea is that which the collective above all strides for. This is a little bit trickier to talk about, but we can think of this as a goal that gets the movement um, that uh, gets the movement to be bound within of itself. This is usually what galvanizes the physical, these people to put away uh, even a small part of their individuality to then group together. Um, the idea is a tricky thing to talk about as there is no one idea, even though I say the idea, there, there's not one thing that gets people to get into these groups. For the most part, we can think of baseline things such like survival. If we all group together, we'd have a much higher chance of living, of prospering, of continuing our offspring and, and, and going on, or uh, having offspring continuing. Um, but the idea can range from this to ideas of political um, achievement, of societal achievement. Um, but this, this central idea, or the idea, if I may engage in a bit of a pun, is that galvanizing force. And it is usually multiple ideas that are wrapped into one that are presented to people um, to get them to put away that bit of their own autonomy to join together. And I do say that most of this is usually, or at least started out with our society as being practical in nature. It, it was survival that brought us together. Uh, it was seeing that if we hedged our bets uh, and, and so, you know, got together, so to speak, our chances of continuing our species were going to just be far greater. Those that can, you know, protect one another of their own kind tend to continue. And the third component I see of this is that of what I think of the abstract. Now, I said that the numbers have nothing to do with the importance or anything like that, and that's true. But I do see the layout of these ideas being important um, in terms of the physical and the abstract being on opposite ends of each other is not coincidental. The physical being literally called the physical, what is around us, that which makes up a collective, is completely opposite from the abstract. The abstract is a, a continuation of the idea to the point of an almost metaphysical being. And what I mean by that really is that there is nothing physical about ideas or larger goals. And especially as time has gone on, we have seen human social interaction become more and more complex. It has stopped being so much about survival of many groups and it become about achieving political means, economic means, social change, governmental reform or governmental change. And these things within of themselves are not physical. They're of an abstract idea. You can't touch the idea of wanting to change your government. The abstract is kind of the link between the physical and the idea, yet opposite of the physical. So these components are not wholly necessary to a collective. I see that generally speaking, most if not all collectives do have those components to them to varying degrees. What may change is a kind of emphasis on which of those components may be uh, exaggerated within a given group or organizing social force. Some may put more on the physical, some may be put, put more in the abstract. There's many different uh, balances you could have. Uh, I do, however, think that there is a inherent necessity um, that a collective needs to be able to function. And I think of these as being suppositions. Suppositions being something that we can think of taking as truth, um, almost as a means to take it as truth. Um, so to the right here of the screen, I have six things. Now, I'm sure at least one of you, <laughs> if not all of you, know a astronomer, a man by the name of Carl Sagan. And during his time, he developed a list of three things that a planet would need to be possessing of life. He said that there would need to be oxygen, a proper climate, and liquid water. And that is actually very important to what we're talking about here, even though astronomy may seem like a very far removed thing from our heavy talk of sociology and all this. But I view a collective, I view human society as being very similar to this idea. There are things that we need. 
there are things that we need to exist the way that we do. And that is what is to the right. These are these suppositions that we need. Um, the first is that of consent not being needed to bring another life into existence, or at least what I would call two-party consent is, is an abbreviation. And what I mean by that is simply the fact that for almost practicality, when two people decide to have a child, there is no way to get that child's consent. Those two people are the consent holders. And this may seem a little strange to point this out. We all know this. This is, you know, um, almost redundant. But I think it's very important that we remember this. We remember that the foundation of our society, as society is nothing more than made up of humans, is based on the idea that you do not need to give consent to people. Once you're born, your consent is very important on a numerous amount of things, though I would argue not as much in the following things, but still, um, I think that's very important to remember, is that we have taken that idea, and all of human existence is based off of that, because if not, there would be no way to get the physical, there would no, be no way to get this general public, people, anyone. Continuing with this idea of consent, I think of a collective, a social grouping organization needing of the physical uh, and or majority consent. And what I mean by that all is that a class of people, especially, and we're going to go back to that hierarchy, which is so important to what we're talking about, needs consent. It needs consent of the people. It needs to be able to function for itself. It needs to be able to con have continuation of itself, but it cannot do what it is meant to do. It cannot achieve its, its abstract. It cannot have its ideas to galvanize. It cannot do any of those aforementioned components or much of anything if the people are not happy. So it needs this consent. Number three is similar to um, the uh, number one in the sense of consent. And that is the economic contribution or manufacturing and contributing to the global uh, uh, domestic product, as I would think of it, without consent. And this is also, once again, very simple. What I think of this being is the idea that when you're born in any society, whether it could, it could be a capitalist one, it could be a communistic one, uh, it could be any number of economic uh, forms um, with commodities, without commodities, with private owned ownership of land, without, you're still expected to in some way contribute to this economic status. You're in some way expected to contribute to the society around you. And we see this all the time with people talking about uh, how social safety nets almost break this, I think is the general fear that, that someone could survive off the collective, off the back of the physical people and not actually contribute anything. We, it, it's a expectation we have that when you're born you will contribute and now many contribute in different ways this can we can contribute by for instance i work in a bakery so i contribute by doing what needs to be done to continue that company and also serving food to those but we can think of contributing to the economy as uh somebody making sculptures somebody writing books somebody you know making statues uh, with uh discarded gum wrappers i mean all these things will eventually find their way back into the economy and find their way back into the economic being of the collective you're expected to do this and if not then you are seen as uh almost a, a social outcast seen as someone who is breaking some unspoken code so number four <clears throat> pardon is very similar to number three it is basically the same thing except when it comes to cultural and social integration. And this is simply the idea that when you're born into a society, you're expected to integrate or, or not even integrate, you're expected, uh, you could think of it almost just you're expected to be able to uh, immediately fit in. Even when you don't have the consent to, to be born and you don't get to choose where you were born, you know, but we expect people, for instance, to uh, conform to the social norms around them, despite whether or not they had any say in the matter. If you were born in say Japan, there are a huge amount of social norms that every child is expected to do, spoken, unspoken, and it's the same in the US. This is the idea that even if you move out of Japan, you know, and you move to say Russia and you're choosing your culture, you're choosing your social norms, you're expected to go by them. You can't go around doing your own. And if you are, I mean, you can face ostracization. You, the, this is something that we are ingrained to believe. And this is important for the collective as Though variation within populations is beneficial in some ways, 
keeping a general tight grip on what the population has in its variety is integral to keeping the consent of people. It is easier to keep the consent of one group than it is 20 groups. So obviously any hierarchical structure is going to lean more towards an idea of wanting a more uh, uniform society, a uniform public. Now, number five is a form of objectivity or a rejection of relativism to some extent. And what I mean by this is, not to get too much into the ideas of objectivity and subjectivity as these are lofty things we could spend an entire presentation talking about, um, a collective needs objectivity. It needs something to, to, to put itself to, especially when hierarchy is involved, because hierarchy is something that inherently means there is some sort of injustice. For a hierarchy to exist, someone needs to have something, um, power, social influence, economic, freedom that someone else doesn't have. And this can cause quite a lot of questions about what gives the right for someone to have that? What gives the right for someone to rule above me? Or what gives the right for someone to decide that they get to live in a higher social status than I do? And this kind of relativism, this kind of idea of looking at things in non-objective terms, um, though it can be tolerated for the most part, it is best to have a rejection of it to a greater extent as having objectivity, having the idea of this is how something is, it is true, and there's nothing you can do to argue about it is very beneficial to this hierarchy. You can then use that objectivity and wield it to can make sure that people are staying docile or at the very least staying, giving you that consent that we had previously mentioned. And finally, I see the ability and the idea of hierarchy um, to be used in social ordination. And this one may seem like the most out of place one, but all I mean by this last is that when we have a social collective, there needs to be some general idea that the ability for some to rule over others is not just just, but it is also uh, uh, also perhaps not virtuous, but is at the very least a necessary evil. And this does tie back into our idea of needing objectivity. So as I've been going on, I have used this word social ordination a few times, which unlike just saying a collective might sound even stranger. I know my mother who is among the audience uh, gets very frustrated because I'm using like a fourth definition of the word ordination and she hates that. Um, and I have purposefully not defined it up until this point. Um, unlike, I mean, I, there was the second slide, I believe, that I defined the collective, and we're on the seventh or, or something, and I have not defined social ordination, and that was by design, because these two things, though being very similar, are also very different, and coming all this way to only define it now allowed for a kind of thought to be sparked within those who are listening to possibly question what it is that the difference of these are, what, what the difference between these words are or how I'm using them. And that is really important to me to spark that idea of people saying, wait a minute, what did he just say? What does he mean by that? Because obviously when I define the collective as how I have, that's just me defining it. I mean, I do not, I'm not a linguist. I'm not a professor. I, I, I'm a, you know, I'm not anything of authority. I simply am giving you this and then people may accept it or they may not. So having that ability to question, well, wait, what is he saying? What does this mean? That's a foundation idea of this project is this project is about questioning this social organization, questioning these collectives around us. But the distinction between these two is the collective, as we've mentioned, is just a general term to talk about how people organize themselves in different groups you know, from corporations to religions, nations, hunter-gatherers, you know, yada, yada, yada. All that great stuff we have seen throughout this presentation. Now, social ordination, I view as a more microcosm uh, uh, of the collective, or perhaps something that exists with more detail, if you were to say, hold up a magnifying glass to the collective. And that is, within these collectives, how people go about their days. These, they, these are these social rules. These are social norms. Social ordination is the introducing of someone into a society and them accepting it, them 
saying all right and obeying by that collective's rule because every collective's goal ultimately is to continue itself that's what any organism does whether it be a, a single cell or we as humans we all need to continue and that's a collective's goal uh, is to continue its its uh, existence and social ordination is just a tool for it to do so and that's what it is is the introducing of someone into an area uh saying these are the cultural religious political economic expectations and them saying oh okay and then going on to abide by those so this is where we reach a bit of an impasse i would say because i could most definitely continue with my presentation um, and I had toyed around with the idea of showing a bit of this analysis and action, breaking down what we established as those six things a collective needs, but it weighed on me a little bit because something that I set out from the beginning with this project to do um, was not to give a necessary finished pre-packaged, this is what you should believe about something, this is what I want you to believe about, say, you know, if I were to use this system that I've just shown some of and use it to look at the United States and say, I don't know, Britain. I, I didn't want to just put forth a uh, prepackaged idea and for people to say, oh, all right, that was his presentation. What I wanted to do here and really try was give a kind of tool, a, a mental tool, a way to look at you not just, you know, culture and sociology and all this stuff, but to look at our everyday lives, to give a different way of analysis. Uh, throughout this project, I did a lot of reading into different areas of critical theory of Marxian analysis, all these different forms of, of analysis of different aspects of society, of, of economic being and all this. Um, and in those, though there are examples given, I never, there, there was never a, you know, this is now what I, you should believe I'm going to tell you. This, this was not the goal of this paper. This is most something that could be done most definitely, but it was not the goal. What I wanted to present here was a, uh, a lens that someone could use, but they would most definitely not be forced. And I believe that if I were to do a specific contrast, it would very much skew people um, into believing whatever the conclusion I came to. When, as we see, if there is one thing that everybody, I think, wants is always we, we want to be different, we want to be rebellious. And if there's one thing that the collective doesn't want, it's for us to not take things at face value. It's for things, uh, it's for us to, uh, you know, analyze things on our own. And that was the goal of this. Ryan. And that is, yeah. And great job. I just want to give you about a five minute warning. Um, we have our next presenter here. And just in case you want to have time for questions. Oh yeah, I was just finishing actually. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, that was it. Perfect, perfect timing. Perfect. Job. So we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Um, the audience can use the chat feature if you want to put questions in there, or you can take your microphone off and ask questions out loud or comments. And you can go ahead and stop the share. Perfect. Yeah. I wasn't struggling like a ram all of my Chromebook for a second. Well, Ryan, I'll start. I thought that was a, I thought that was a very comprehensive presentation. Um, as always, you never ever cease to amaze me with um, just your your savvy for for language and how you communicate in a very thorough and comprehensive way. So, I don't have questions per se, but I think just some acknowledgments of I think that this is you mentioned at the end of your presentation that this gives us the the audience an opportunity to take a look at um, societal norms and groupings through a lens. And I thought you did so in a very objective manner through your research. Um, I thought you gave us the opportunity to see how we gather as community <clears throat> and how we're able to kind of coexist in a way through our belief system and through our ideals and how those uh, collectives that you mentioned are formed in, in that regard. Uh, that, you know, when we come into this world, we don't choose per se, but, but we're brought up through those ideals, through those norms. Um, and I just thought the way that you took us through the evolution of that um, in, in looking through that lens, and I might even go on to say through different lenses, allows us to see, you know, just 
the times that we're managing through today, um, I think it's safe to say that even with the political divide, you know, that has has occurred in our own country and, and seeing the different viewpoints, I think that this presentation has given us the opportunity to see how we come to that place. Um, and I'm very grateful that you gave us the chance to really see that evolution through your eyes, through a very objective lens, through some very thorough research. Um, you had a wonderful mentor through this project, and it sounds like your partnership together has really um, gleamed some light on some very important things that I think would be worthwhile for anybody in this society or multiple societies to view. So thank you for that. Well said, Mr. Buno, I would totally agree. Um, and I think we're all just very, very proud of you and your independence in taking this on. And I know that this was um, a second capstone project that you took on. Um, and I'm just really, really impressed with your bravery and courage to really delve into, like Mr. Buno said, a topic that's, that's tough and, um, and can definitely be controversial. But I think you stayed neutral and you, um, you really did a great job in terms of, of keeping all bases covered. How would you say this is different or the same to last year's Capstone project? Um, I mean, putting the pandemic aside, which definitely impacted the uh, cap the, pr the project in ways that, you know, I, I couldn't control. In some way, I feel it's actually very similar um, because uh, last year's had to do with music. And obviously music is just a different way in which that we communicate. Um, and this had a lot to do, especially by the end, had a lot to do with linguistics, had a lot to do with different terminology. Um, and I felt uh, very at home, if I may speak a little exaggeratory, um, exploring those areas as I see English as just a different form of music that everybody can speak. Um, so I, I thought it was almost in a way very similar. This really anticipated actually, Ryan, a question I had for you because um, I know that you're a talented musician and I know um, from our conversations about your capstone, your previous capstone project, and, um, and it really has occurred to me that your approach, um, everything from thinking about how you define, you know, um, develop your lexicon and define your terminology um, and also uh, providing a system or a framework for um, for uh, those of us who um, learn from your research um, to uh, apply our own lenses to to different um, different targets, different societies, etc. Rather than giving us a kind of predefined analysis, um, I, I really had been actually curious um, to know how much your um, your your life as a musician and your musician's brain have influenced um, that that way of thinking. Um, and so, you know, and I'm, I think I'm curious also kind of flipping it back in the other direction. Um, I, I've tended to think very, um, in very um, large scale terms about, about the applicability of your research, but then it occurs to me, it, it also potentially folds back to um, the collective of um, a musical group, an orchestra or a band, or, um, you know, a, any kind of endeavor of musicians coming together. Is that, am I taking it too far or would, would you agree with that? Not at all. In fact, I'm a little angry now because I missed the, the most obvious path to go down there. And my I kept mentioning religious groups, uh, corporations, all that. I missed the, the orchestra. I, I feel egg on my face. Um, no, I, I think that's exactly it. I mean, really what I just wanted to discuss was, um, you know, social grouping, which is such a broad thing. It, it was almost kind of hard to put into a presentation, too. Um, but yeah, definitely, I mean, you could totally apply this to musical groups, to different dynamics and hierarchies within bands. I mean, an orchestra alone has so much of it, um, you know, in terms of uh, a conductor who we can see as a leader, as different sections, as all these different areas we could take it. So no, I think that's exactly, uh, I, I'm happy that that sparked that. And like I said, I, I wish I did that in now, but hindsight's 2020. All right, clearly, I should have asked that question weeks ago. <laughs> Okay, so Ryan, I'll curveball you. Can we have collectives without hierarchy? You can have, in, in, my, in my opinion, I mean, since hierarchy was such an important idea, 
in, in most of what we've seen as human existence, because obviously I could only look at the past and the present. I couldn't look at the future. I could make guesses, but it wasn't too much about this. Um, hierarchy is such an ingrained thing that we have. I do think that if we were to see a system which truly abolished hierarchy, and we're not talking about uh, equality. Equality still has hierarchy. We were talking about a system that is completely void of power structures in that nature. I think no, because the collective is based on past human modes of being. Um, if you were to get rid of all hierarchy within a system, then you would be left with something wholly different than really what we've experienced. We've come close to that with many different tribes and many different areas. I did some research during this about different Native American tribes who had very different ways of organizing themselves. I decided to leave it out because there was so much information there. I felt like I, um, I mean, I, I would have needed like five more weeks to, that, that's a whole area, very, uh, you know, dense information. Um, but no, I think if you were to take hierarchy out, collective would be, or the collective, it would fall apart. There needs to be structure in it. There needs to be, and I'm not saying a moral prescription that I think that's good, but at that point, we would need to come up with a different term or we, we would, you know, I think we should. I don't think we should keep using the aforementioned one. Great answers to some tough questions. Nice job, Ryan. Well, I think we're all very, very proud of you. Nice job. Nice way to end the year. Um, and I just wanted to thank everyone that came tonight. And I wanted to do a special thanks to Allison Coleman, um, not only for mentoring Ryan, but you've been a mentor for many students um, through the years. And we appreciate your dedication. So thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Very good. Special thanks to her. She helped me so much with all this project. Um, if, if I ever, if I do another capstone senior year, you bet that I might try and rope her in again. Oh, that's that's how. <laughs> You're oh, and up. special thanks. To, special thanks to my dog who's on my bed who managed to not like not my feet during this entire thing for attention too. I appreciate it's sad it. that we can't see her actually. <laughs> hey, Zara. Turn, turn around. Uh, Hello. <laughs> <She's very laughs> here. Um, Emma Johnson is going to be presenting on a research study on fast fashion. So I'm going to turn it over to Emma. If you can hear me, you can turn your camera on. Perfect, thank you. Um, so I went a lot of different directions with my project. I started out actually wanting to do um, like design and create physically like a fashion a fashion line that was like inspired by um the earth's pollution like litter and like physical litter that i i cleaned and um took off the ground and made materiality you know like textiles out of and um i ended up like just kind of i realized that like the research process would take a lot longer than i thought and i kind of just decided to to continue that, um, like continue that um, process, like that that venture on my own time, and kind of work through it, like without without a time limit, and um, and just focus on the, the research portion of it. And I also I also just wanted to give a presentation that could potentially impact every someone's everyday life, and and their you know, their perception of the fashion industry. So, um, fashion is a mandatory form of self-expression, and it's one of the few inescapable ones that's valuable in that it has a lot more influence in our lives and in our position in society that we don't understand. It could seem mundane to a lot of people. You wake up, do some quick matching, and then you're legally taken care of for the day. But regardless of whether you notice or you take time to acknowledge it, your outfits are always something that satisfies you emotionally and psychologically, at least just for that moment. They're a snapshot, a, na a snapshot of your, your mood, a transient thought, something that should be in our control, something that everybody has an opinion on. You can associate certain garments or styles to a movie character, a model that you follow, a family member, or even a Twitter mutual. 
with the one shirt from Forever 21 without a stain that you found under the pile or the UNIF sweater that you can't afford from Depop. We rely on fashion to be a dependable communicator of the formality of an event or to explore the limits of our identity. But unfortunately, just according to capitalist habit, money has compromised originality and expression and even the dignity that we're due through a good quality shirt. So I'm first going to talk about fast, fast fashion, kind of what it is, just in case anybody doesn't really know. So it's defined by the Good Trade, which is a sustainable fashion and lifestyle blog as a design, manufacturing, and marketing method focused on rapidly producing high volumes of clothing. Garment production utilizes trend replication and low quality materials in order to bring inexpensive styles to the public. So fast fashion is a prioritization of quantity because demand of absurd amounts maximizes profit. The business model and action wholly undermines the artistry and intricacy behind the roots of the industry and all of the inspiration that it's meant to provide. Popularizing itself slowly starting in the 1980s, fast fashion is an exclusively capitalist approach to the fashion industry and rewrites design and production goals with a selfish and severely exploitative ex economic agenda. The agenda of fast fashion supporting companies appears to quietly and grandly exploit workers as well as our own natural resources while making a hefty profit purposefully not reflected in the salary of factory workers who produce the clothing. Work is often outsourced, which is ultimately used as a money saver and a tool to avoid and dissociate from regulation or guilt. In the last 30 years, fashion has gone from a $500 billion, mostly domestic trade to a $2.4 trillion a year global trade and to be more precise with that statistic, 56.2% of clothes purchased in the U.S. were American-made in 1991, and now, or actually in 2012, it went all the way down to 2.5% of clothes being made in America. And that drastic downhill slope um, is perfectly representative of what happens when greed takes over the minds of these corporations. So the the bureau of labor statistics reports that in from 1990 to 2012 the u.s textile and garment industry lost over like 1.2 million jobs just to this like industrialized um like evolution of of the fashion industry and you can see like you know just the the more technologically focused, you know, it's much less lively. There's much less to to be celebrating in in these these textile districts. So now that you're you're familiar, you're a little bit more familiar with what outsourcing is like outsourcing to um, to foreign companies with less you know less um, labor regulations. Um, you might be wondering like why why does it matter that we're that we are making more money because we're we're sending all of these all of these products overseas and then getting them getting them back we might lose jobs in america but really what is the what is the cost of all of this and the cost is in the human rights really the factories aren't federally owned so safety and labor regulations can be overlooked without liabilities and the workers receive poverty level and below wages without corporate supervision and the workers could receive and yeah and the workers receive the workers could receive poverty level and below wages without corporate supervision or representation ethics and human rights go out the window and workers could remain stuck at the oppressed end of an exploitative work relationship because their livelihood depends on it and the company depends on their insufferable labor. There have been cases of, of slavery, child labor, and prison labor amongst like very, very popular um, fast fashion brands. And um, if you want any insight on um, the mass incar incarcerations and, the, and a whole bunch of prison labor, 
controversies that were um, actually kind of orchestrated by um, by some brands like Victoria's Secret and even Walmart, then you could watch the documentary 13th. Um, it's, a good, it's a good reference for that. Um, so actually fewer than 2% of fast fashion work factory workers overseas learn a living wage. And I read, I read this book called Fashionopolis, The Price of Fast Fashion and the Future of Clothes by Dana Thomas. And it cites an example of a real situation concerning a female worker in Sri Lanka who had only a toothache. And the quote, the quote was, she had to take out a loan to pay for it because on her wage, she couldn't afford a dentist appointment. NGO, and this is from an NGO official speaking at the SOCAP 17 conference in San Francisco, which is a conference whose goal is to accelerate a new global market at the intersection of money and learning. So the driving, the driving motivation for the fast fashion outsourcing turnover amongst clothing brands like Zara and Forever 21 is the guaranteed influx of income that I will bring to them, cementing them into a constant pattern of growth or at least easy and convenient popularity. The majority of fast fashion clothing is manufactured with synthetic material, thereby lowering its overall quality, including factors of general wear and tear, fit and appearance. These are small areas of which you could yourself recognize fast fashion within your own closet or, you know, going to the mall. Um, and when you see variations of the, same um, of the same piece with millions of copies on a rack or even like the same variation of shirts or misplaced, like misplaced threads and seams from that could possibly be from, um, you know, a factory machine or even from a, you know, an overtired, sleep-deprived factory worker. Um, apparel, apparel constructed of synthetic fibers as opposed to natural fibers or even blends take a larger added toll on the environment in its manufacture, its transportation, its disposal, and its decomposition into our soil. So, the precedence that quality takes over, that quality takes over quantity, or that quantity, sorry, takes over quality, originality, and freedom of expression in fast fashion stores is evident. The, simple, the simpler and safer the garment design, the greater the audience of buyers, especially in navigating a conformity-seeking trends environment. So, here I have defined for you the synthetic versus natural fibers. And as you could see, um, as you could see, these are just a few um, different examples that I pulled from like super popular, super popular clothing store website apps, sort of, you know, based like they they sell clothes based on what the trends are. So um you can see there's a rayon and nylon blend in the Forever 21, which is obviously all, those are all synthetic materials. And Shein, which is like just a ridiculously cheap fast fashion brand, is 100% polyester, which I'll talk about later. Polyester is like the most, the most destructive, um, the most destructive fiber, you know, in the, the fast fashion universe. And um, Zara, which is the like the the leading producer it's the largest brand in the world um and it yeah it actually a funny funny story is um like i was i'll get i'll get into this later kind of like the the quantity and the the consumption and how it's increased over the years but like it's just just a funny funny story is that um i was like we were in Spanish class and we were asked, like, we were all asked what our favorite store was just as like an attendance question. And I just thought it was interesting. Every single, every single girl in the class um, besides me and maybe like one other person answered Zara as their favorite, which is just, it's just like an indicator of how like widespread and popular these clothing brands are. Like they really just dominate over like, 
um, every single group of people. So now I'm going to talk about trends. So. Um, okay, so nowadays synthetic, which are cheap quality and less societally daring garments resemble the current popular styles and or trends are dialed back in complexity to a more casually accepted and conveniently easily manufactured level. So the less satisfied that we are through repetitive and easy to buy garments, the greater urge that we have to buy for just for the purpose of quantity. Um, a question that I thought about a lot during my research was like, not only just what drives people like psychologically to buy things, but what makes them want to keep buying after they, they buy one thing. Um, the increase in consumption is very real. In 2013, the Center for Media Research announced that shopping was becoming America's favorite pastime. Um, so the act of consumption is replacing appreciate, appreciation as a fashion-related hobby, um, of course, mostly referring to those people who don't consider fashion studies as, like, their primary focus. Like, the, the act of consuming is taking over, like, the, the admiration of the, the art itself. Um, and this is not to say that you're wrong. I liked, I really like to clarify this when I talk about this kind of stuff. Um, it's not to say that um, you like personally enjoying designs that are quote trendy is a bad th thing or is a wrong thing at all. Because um, just in case you don't, um, you don't necessarily understand here. So the, the whole idea of a trend starts at the runway, like the, the higher ups, um, the designs that were projected to be future collections years before. Um, and then the designs that are sold at Forever 21, American Eagle, Hollister, and Zara are just modified, dumbed down mirror images of ready to wear pieces from the runway that are sure to grab the attention of mall goers looking for something to buy that's new and exciting yet provides a feeling of familiarity and safety in the number of people wearing buying and posting the items especially in the age of social media trends make casual buyers feel the need to blend in as much as possible and could make them feel isolated if they don't and at least that's the intention of these clothing giants the both subtle and blatant mimicking of designs that travel down the industry ladder from their original designers to the Shein web pages are also what allow for so many cases of stolen artistic property. Like, there are plenty of cases I see on, like, artists I, I follow on, you know, different places all the time. I see stories about their, 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 their property, their art, um, their work just being stolen and copied and made into a uh, like a much less quality piece by Shein most popular popularly um because it's just they they care it's safe to say that they they care the least about their their quality of of clothing Sp like come from somebody who used to who used to buy um Shein clothing for the same exact reasons and whenever it came in the mail it would smell like burning rubber and it would just completely not be the same um it would not have the same fit that it did in the you know in the description um so the problem isn't enjoying these trends as your own form of self-expression but the manipulative strategy of clothing brands just meant in their um just meant in the end to expand their own manufacturing at a staggering rate because that's what brings in the absurd loads of money and that easy but visibly destructive cycle is what makes fast fashion such a foul addiction with monstrous strength and influence over its consumers um, and this is apparent with the numbers as well um, generally now shoppers buy five times more 
than they did in the 80s, um, which was the beginning, again, of the fast fashion surge. And um, from, from the book Fashionopolis that I mentioned before, um, she wrote that if the global population swells to 8.5 billion by 2030 and GDP per capita rises by 2% in developing nations and 4% in developing economies each of those intervening years, as experts predict, and we don't change our consumption habits, um, we will buy 63% more fashion from 62 million tons to 102 million tons, which is roughly equivalent to 500 billion t-shirts. And there's just a, a quick example of a knockoff that you might see in, if you walk into any store in the mall. So one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite um, educators and designers and sewists on, on YouTube that I like to, I like to watch, um, her name is the, the Closet Historian and I, um, I have a, just an excerpt of the video about polyester, um, which I guarantee you if you look through your closet and just look through the, um, the makeup of the, um, the fibers, you'll, you'll, you'll stumble across a lot of, a lot of polyester. So the number that I have here is actually counting down. It was from, it was a timestamp from my phone. So I'm going to try to find the, the right moment, <laughs> which I think I could do. industry increased from 8.3 to 21.3 million tons annually. At the same time, the world's total garment production has roughly doubled. In 2014, it crossed the threshold of 100 billion items. A big polluter yeah. is made from oil and falls apart into tiny little microplastics that will last a millennia. But Bianca, cotton uses so much water, it's terrible for the environment. Fine, what is this? School? Polyester production emits the greatest CO2 emissions, ranging from 7.2 to 9.52 kilograms of CO2 per ton of fiber. Again, CO2 emissions associated with cotton range widely from 2.35 to 5.89 kilograms of CO2 per ton of fiber. It shows that polyester production is the most energy intensive, requiring approximately 10 times more energy than organic cotton, which consumes the least energy. Consequently, polyester emits the greatest quantity of CO2 emissions, but in this case, it is only four times that of organic cotton, the smallest emitter of CO2 emissions. However, the best overall performer in the ecological footprint context is traditional organic hemp, two times better than the worst performer cotton in this area. In terms of water consumption, cotton requires 9,758 kilograms of water per kilogram of fiber, while hemp requires two to 3,000 kilograms of water per fiber. As hemp presents a tiny fraction, 0.15% of world textile production, it seems highly unviable option for consumers, end quote, because I just want to make a note here to say that there's a reason that there's not much hemp out there. And that's because A, people like to think that hemp and marijuana are the same crop. And B, the people who make cotton don't want anyone to be growing hemp because it's a better option. And that will put them into having less business. <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> back to the quote. Uh, production of polyester, even if the energy requirements are met by renewable sources, cannot be sustained indefinitely. The raw material, oil, is a non-renewable resource which will in time run out. However, it is suggested that it is a wiser use of oil than simply burning it for energy production. The other toxic emissions... Okay, that's, that's all that I wanted to, to show for the time being. I recommend you watch this whole video though, because it's super informative and she is very articulate in the way that she she relays information um but yeah so basically polyester it it pollutes our water supply um a lot like even every time every time you um you wash clothing in your your washing machine that has polyester um it will release like microfibers microplastics like into your water supply, it just it it pollutes everything. It's very bad, and also it it's it's non-renewable. Um, yeah, so it's just like it's just an economic benefit.
for these major companies. And just a disclaimer that is very necessary to make during these presentations, it's very, or during these um, conversations, um, is that fast fashion is uh, a machine and it's larger and more powerful than any of us can fathom, which is exactly why we all have and still do fall victim to it. Um, Facebook, Instagram, Shein, American Eagle, Hollister, Zara, um, they all, they're, they all, they all advertise to us, um, you know, and they're all also guilt tripping us into thinking that we are the mo ones that are most responsible in maintaining like ethical buyership, which is true, but at the same time, um, corporations will take it upon themselves to place most of the guilt, like most of the guilt on the consumers, which to their benefit leaves them in the same untethered position of power over the workers and the consumers. So um, not everybody is in the position or has the privilege to shop ethically or even have access to the information that tells us what we need to know about what we're buying. None of us None of us are angels, and that self-blame a lot of the time is just a distraction from the fact that these companies could fully afford to make changes and potentially pull workers out of poverty um, and just have a way, more, a way more ethical industry altogether. Um, so yeah, in, in conclusion, um, check your labels. Um, and again, your label doesn't, you know, like what you buy doesn't necessarily have to say much about, about you as a person. It's your, your personal moral responsibility and what you can afford um, within yourself. And um, as Dana Thomas stated in Fashionopolis, Clothes are our most initial and basic tool of communication. They convey our social and economic status, our occupation, our ambition, and our self-worth. They can empower us, imbue us with sensuality. They can reveal our respect, our respect or our disregard for convention. Um, so popularizing cheaply made, simply designed, simply designed um, pieces tells us that that is what the world expects from us and anything else outside of the box is abnormal and unaccepted. It strips us from our inherent creativity, which is also um, a big problem of mine um, with fast fashion, being somebody that wants to um, enter into the fashion industry. Um, so oftentimes these conditions permit us to dissociate ourselves from the guilt out of sight, out of mind. Um, and one of my good friends once said to me that fashion isn't, um, fashion isn't what we wear, but fashion is conscious thought. And we've been forced to abide by conventions and seek them out to please one another forever. And it's my belief that exercising our conscious thought toward our, our spending habits and um, our awareness on, on fast fashion, the environment, um, and all these industries together could help us um, destroy all these conventions. So thank you very much. <laughs> That's it. Ah, uh, Emma. Really interesting topic. I, and I, I think of the, the phrase quality versus quantity. Um, really kind of comes into play here. You know, you could, I always think about where can I get the most bang for my buck if I can get three pieces of clothing for the same price as one really high quality piece of clothing. Yeah, um, there was, a, sorry, really quick. There was like a study about that actually. Like people, like there was a, like a huge survey amongst a lot of people um, and amongst like a lot of salaries, like, mm -hmm. um, larger salaries like everybody had the basically the what I'm trying to say is everybody had the same answer like no matter whether whether you had like a huge annual income or a smaller one everybody decided that they would rather they would rather you know jump to save their money first mm -hmm. and I wonder if um 
if age plays a part into this and, and maybe not always, but um, I, cause I remember forever 21 has been around forever. And I remember in high school, I would go there and I would just get like five or six pieces. And I knew that it would only last me probably about a month cause it would rip. <laughs> and, um, and now as I'm getting older, I'm a little more willing to spend a little more on the quality of clothing. And I wonder if you think that plays into it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like vulnerability is a huge bit of it. Like, um, like I like I live it. You know, my friends live it. Like, we all we all are on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, Depop, and um, you know, major influencers, celebrities, and marketing things for us that aren't very ethical because these huge brands are paying them loads of money to wear these things and then say okay like you, everybody buy fashion nova and use my code and then that's where that whole thing starts so it definitely like it plays a part in like people um like seeking comfort in conformity when they're younger and just kind of like preying off of you know social media norms and people having hierarchy and um popularity online and in school and things like that and it's also like, it, I was just I was just talking about this with my friend. It's like weird um, because I guess for some people Zara could be affordable, but to me it's like still like really expensive for what it is. Mm -hmm. um, it says a lot about like um, these these sort of these huge brands, these these huge companies. Um, they really it really is more about like how much they're producing because Zara just produces like an absurd amount of, of clothing and is pretty shady in the act of it. So um, even though they're not like the most affordable brand, they're still like a huge um, like fast fashion, you know. Emma, did you learn anything about Amazon clothing in, in your study at all oh, and how that plays into it? I'm just curious. No, I, I will. I Now that you say that, I definitely will. I like... Um, I've been thinking about that for a while because, like, even, like, even I will think, like, um, I mean, I do know a lot about, um, not a lot, actually, but I know, I know of a little bit about, you know, like, a lot of different Amazon workers' rights, um, like, protests that have been going on for a while, and I know that those conditions are pretty bad, and a lot of the benefits they get aren't, aren't good in the hours, and, um, but even I have, like, seen that, you know, Amazon is, like, super convenient, and it's super fast, and it's cheap, and it's so easy to buy something on there, and it's, like, if you see, if you see something that you need, then you think, like, there's no harm done if you just buy it once, so I definitely will look into that more. Yeah, that was actually, you stole my question, Mrs. McDonald. I, I think that I'm beginning to, um, especially post-pandemic, where online shopping is becoming more of a convenience, uh, I'm looking to platforms like Amazon uh, to rely on my fashion, but I'm not necessarily being as conscientious about um, the makeup of said brand. Um, and I think online shopping in general, too. I, I think when I'm there and able to see and be able to kind of determine the quality. And I think that comes with experience, right? By being there, by trying it on, you can sometimes get a better feel for what it's like. But I wonder too, if online shopping in general is going to help us feed more into that, that um, fast fashion trends. You know, are we gonna be able to determine or decipher that quality? Are we gonna have to do more research or become more well-informed before making those purchases um, in an online platform? Yeah, I mean, like, you could see, like, I never, before I learned about different things, I never would look um, at the, the makeup of the fibers, like, on clothes that I, I bought, and then I'm, you know, I was getting rid of a ton of clothes, and I would just check the tags, and it was all, like, nylon and rayon and just all, all synthetic materials, and you don't really realize things like that, but um, it's definitely, online shopping definitely, um, it has to do with convenience mostly like that's that's pretty much like it's just it's quick it's quick to buy something and also I feel like um 
like once you buy something online the purchase is is done like you've already bought it but once you Mm -hmm. go like there have been a lot of times where I've gone in the mall and gone into these different stores like Forever 21 and American Eagle and I've just like they've been like all the clothes are sometimes just visibly like bad quality so (laughs) if you like see that then it kind of could it could turn you off of buying them in the first place so I think online shopping definitely definitely makes it easier for them to to get their money so what's your favorite store to shop at um I don't know I use I I go savers and and goodwill like I um I try to mostly mostly thrift um Mm -hmm. Where, where else do we shop? We, like, I go, I like to, I like going to um, art fairs and stuff, like, for jewelry, mm-hmm. and um, I go to my friend's cabin to a flea market, and they sell a lot of cool clothes. I like vintage stores, because the clothes mm-hmm. are, like, high quality, and I also, like, I'm just a fashion person, so I, like, really like, like, extravagant, like, garments a lot of the time, so, like, yeah. I don't know. But a lot of the time, like, actually, what I, I've noticed that thrift stores are are starting to sell, like, getting to the point in time where thrift stores are starting to sell, like, um, you know, Shein and, like, because they're secondhand stores, obviously, so they take what they're mm-hmm. given. But instead of selling, like, older stuff, they're selling, they're starting to sell more and more, like, modern brands, which is definitely a better alternative than supporting the brand directly buying it secondhand if you like really wanted to you know it sounds like you learned a lot in this process was that helpful did you enjoy doing the project yeah I like do it on my own anyways like I like watch those kinds of YouTube videos and like listen to those podcasts anyways so like it wasn't a very it wasn't like it was it was fun like it's like and it helps me to to like take notes to remember things anyways so it was kind of like it was fun to just like know that I was research researching for something you know good well you did a nice job thank you so much for your work towards this and have any good summer plans some shopping (laughs) um yes definitely um always